Hi everybody, good good, good afternoon now I guess, good afternoon and welcome back to the British Library and to the Z Jaipur Literature Festival. Uh, we, I'm Jamie Andrews, uh, I'm uh, Head of Culture and Learning here at the British Library and I'm going to be uh, introducing and um, uh, light touch ringmastering this next session 10 treasures, 10 South Asian treasures of the British Library. Uh, the previous session was all about the Fab Four, and for this session we have the Fab Six, which uh, are six of my curatorial colleagues from the British Library, uh, who will talk about 10 <coughs> incredible, rare, precious uh, collections from the British Library relating to South Asia. We're not necessarily saying the top 10, that would be an almost uh, impossible call to make, but 10 really special objects uh, which they will talk about uh, and will be illustrated on the screen here. Uh, we're talking about 10 objects today. Of course, I said it earlier, it's worth repeating, our collections are vast and enormous and almost limitless. Just in relation to collections relating to South Asia and India, we have over 500,000 printed books, 20,000 manuscripts, uh, sound recordings, prints, drawings, and so much more. So there's a wealth of material there. You'll learn a little bit today about 10 very special items. I'd encourage you, as I said earlier, if you were here, to do go into our treasures gallery in the main building, the main building behind me, where there are a, a further a selection of some of our most beautiful objects relating to South Asia on display. So do make time to go and find the gallery if you can. It's free entry. So uh, the way we're going to do this is uh, a relay race style. I will hand over to uh, Ursula in just one second, who will talk about the first couple of treasures, and then we will pass the baton on. Uh, and we will make sure that we have uh, 15 minutes or so at the end for questions about uh, these collections or about anything to do with the British Library and South Asia and India. So uh, we will start off uh, uh, with Ursula Sims-Williams, who is lead curator of our Persian collections here at the library. Well, hello, and um, I'm starting off with treasures number one, Zoroastrian treasures in the British Library. Um, right. <laughs> Just a bit of background. Zoroastrianism is the religion of the ancient Iranians. It originated in Central Asia in the second millennium BC, spreading east to China and southwest to Iran, where it became the established religion until the Arab conquest in the mid seventh century AD. With the arrival of Islam, many Zoroastrians from Iran settled in South Asia forming Parsi communities which survive today. So it was very exciting that one of our recent joint projects with India was the exhibition Everlasting Flame, Zoroastrianism in History and Imagination, held at the National Museum in Delhi last year. <coughs> the exhibition was led by SOAS in collaboration with the British Library and other partners. The British Library lent 29 key items, and it was a first for us, not only because it was the first time we had worked with an institution such as the National Museum in Delhi, but it was also the first time we had loaned original items to India. And here are three examples of manuscripts that we lent. On the left, oh, I can't see it, but anyway. On the left, um, a um, document from dating from the 9th century, a Zoroastrian prayer from Central Asia, from Dunhuang, in fact. In the middle, a post-medieval European manuscript which illustrates the sage Zoroaster in his study, the founder of the several, seven liberal arts. And on the right, a Zoroastrian law book from 17th century Iran. And this just typifies the very rich diversity of our Zoroastrian collections here at the British Library. So collection number one um, is the collection of Thomas, Thomas Hyde. Um, 
I should explain that the Zoroastrian scriptures were composed in Avestan, which is an ancient Iranian language closely related, related to Vedic Sanskrit. And we have three main Zoroastrian collections, and this is the first one, Thomas Hyde, the oldest, dating from the 17th century. Thomas Hyde was the first European to take a serious interest in Zoroastrianism. Though he never set foot outside the UK himself, his collection, acquired largely through East India Company contacts, predates all others outside of India by about 100 years. Our next treasure. About a century later, Samuel Guise, a surgeon for the East India Company based at Surat, also became interested in Zoroastrianism. He had the good fortune to be able to purchase an important collection from the widow of one of the most famous Zoroastrian priests. His collection included a religious legal work copied in India at the beginning of the 14th century, one of the oldest manuscripts to have survived. And here we see a diagram of illustrating the Haoma ceremony, which is an integral part of Zoroastrian worship. The third treasure was made by a Parsi from Mumbai, Buzurji Surabji Ashburner, who wrote offering some 70 to 80 volumes as a gift in 1864. That's almost 100 years later than Samuel Guise. His collection included, amongst others, manuscripts which had been brought from Iran, such as this one, which dates from 1647 and is a copy of the sacred law book, the Vendidad. This manuscript is decorated with headings of different kinds of trees, which you can see here. And it's most unusual for Zoroastrian manuscripts to be illustrated at all. Um, there are only about four known to exist. In fact, they're all by this same scribe, and so we're very lucky to have one of them here in our collections. So now for something quite different, Mughal manuscripts. Or rather, I should say Persian Mughal treasures, because that's what I'm going to talk about. An interesting fact which people may not be aware of, more than 60% of our 11,000 plus Persian manuscripts come from South Asia. They cover a wide range of subjects, including original works by South Asian authors, both Muslim and Hindu, copies of Iranian popular classics, and manuscripts which were acquired by South Asian owners. One of the most important of these is the Akbar Name, the history of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, who reigned from 1556 to 1605. It was commissioned by the emperor and written by the court historian Abul Fazl. This imperial copy was completed around 1602 and contains 39 paintings by different artists in the royal workshop. Our copy is the first of a three-part set and it covers the history of the Timurid <coughs> dynasty before Akbar and Akbar's childhood. And here we see, on the left hand, two frames, the text by the famous calligrapher Muhammad Hossein Kashmiri. And the margins, I don't know if you can see them, but um, they were decorated later under the patronage of the Emperor Jahangir. Then we have, um, second to the right, celebrations for the birth of Timur, the founder of the Timurid dynasty. And in the right-hand corner, I'm really sorry, you probably can't see the detail, but there's good news, which I'll tell you later. Um, in the corner, we have some astrologers who are fixing his horoscope. On the right, um, a scene figuring European, Portuguese, in fact, um, featuring the Sultan Bahadur Shah, the Sultan of Gujarat, who was thrown into the sea to drown by the Portuguese. This is the Akbar Nama, yes. All this is, I'm talking about, the Akbar Nama. Four more illustrations from the Akbar Nama. On the left, 
the Emperor Humayun, that's Akbar's father, in exile, he took refuge with the Safavid Shah Tahmasp of Iran, and this painting records their meeting. Next to that, we have a hunting scene of Humayun and Shah Tahmasp together. Then over on the right here, an informal scene um, in taking place in Kabul after Humayun's return from Iran on his way back to India. And this um, is in the women's quarter. So you see a lot of the women here celebrating and dancing. And they're celebrating the occasion of, the, of Akbar's circumcision. Akbar had been left behind in Kabul. He didn't go on exile to Iran with Humayun. And this was when they came back and picked him up again. And then on the right, another informal painting which shows the young Emperor Akbar having shooting lessons. You can just see him here. So um, that concludes my introduction to the Akbar Nama. But the good news that I mentioned earlier is that this is one of 50 select manuscripts which we have, in fact, digitized. So you can examine it for yourselves at home, on your computers, or even on your mobile phone. And also, most important, it is currently on display in the Treasures Gallery, so please take time to go over there and have a look at it, because it's a very, it's a very precious manuscript and we don't often display it. If you're interested in this kind of thing, then please follow our blog. Below you can see examples of mogul manuscripts, iconic mogul manuscripts that we've written about in our blog. They're all illustrated and they all have very helpful links back to the digital images if you're interested. Thank you very much. So um, now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Laili, who's the project curator of Two Centuries of Indian Print. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, thank you. I'm Dr. Laili Adeen, the project curator for Two Centuries of Indian Print. The Two Centuries of Indian Print is really a digitization project with the aim to digitize all of the, sort of, with the ambitious sort of remit to digitize approximately 140,000 early sort of printed books across all South Asian languages. But the sort of, at the the first phase of the two centuries of Indian print so is to start with Bengali books, which offers us the most continuous form of um, production and printing. And what we are currently doing is we're digitizing 4,000 early printed books from sort of the mid 19th century of almost 1,000 of which are unique and rare and unlikely to be found anywhere else outside of the BL. Now, these books cover all range of subjects. They cover romances, they religion, society, poetry, fiction, drama, law. And some of those, I mean, they don't offer the most exciting of sort of pictures, but they are quite exciting in terms of the content that we have. And I'm going to take you through a selection of these books. So one of the things that we have in Bengali is actually the first railway guide. Now, what we have in sort of rail, Indian sort of railways being introduced in 1854. And what we have up here is a, a sort of an etiquette sort of um, book for railway travelers. So people traveling for the first time, and we have an example of a train timetable which details your sort of your fares from the first, second, third um, class. So anyone who's a sort of an aspirational traveler looking to travel from th second to first, they get a sense of the prices. You get a sense of the sort of the distance taken to travel from one station to the other, and the time taken. The other things that the other things that is that you have a certain set of rules. So it gives you a, 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 set, a set of instructions about you know what sort of luggages to take on, what compartments you get on, what foods to take on to you know what foods to take on, so that the smell doesn't travel from one compartment to another. So some really exciting things in the in this railway guide. And the next one that we have here is animal biographies, which doesn't sound really exciting, but 
actually they're pretty exciting. Um, it came out, um, these were produced by the Calcutta School Book Society. So these are Baptist missionaries who are producing school books, but with the interesting agenda of not producing any books, um, any books on religion. So all of these were books. Uh, so this is one of the first sort of printing presses, uh, Baptist missionary prints, presses with a secular modern agenda. And these were, besides arithmetic and ge sort of geography, they produced these animal biographies. And one of the things that was written when people saw the, the wood engraving of the lion is that most of the students apparently had left the room out of fear, um, having seen the wood engraving because they only thought that there was just the one lion. So what was it doing on, on paper? So that's, um, and, and with each of the animal biographies, you had a little couplet about the a little poem about uh, sort of about these animals. They're quite exciting. Um, and then we have plenty of stories and tells. So what you have in Bengali is plenty of sort of swashbuckling tells of adventure. So there's wars, there's love, there's romance, there's tragedy. And this is one of um, the more sort of famous illustrations from the from Bharat Chandra Rai's um, Another Mangal. And what we have, the Another Mangal was a narrative poem that was brought out in praise of Annapurna, who was a goddess in the form of Parvati. And one of the few sort of narrative poems that was addressing a lower deity as such. And what we have is a narrative, a picture here, of a, a sort of one of the famous wars between Man Singh, who was a sort of a trusted general of Akbar, and Pratap Aditya, of, uh, who was the Maharaja of Jashur. Um, and uh, so, and it's a fantastic, I mean, it's a, it goes in three parts. It's a, it's a long narrative poem, but um, you, and you get various sort of stories of that kind. We have various stories on demons, jinns, um, and other kinds. Um, and then going back to, this is another one in our collection which offers one of the first few printed maps in sort of Bengali. And you have an, in, a, get a sense of what was being shown in these maps. So for those who are unable to read Bengali, you have <coughs> Australia being depicted as New Holland. Um, and it's interesting as to why Australia is being depicted as New Holland. I don't have the answer for that, but uh, if anyone does, I'm more than uh, sort of interested to know. But um, I mean, so we have, a rich collection of books, and I'd be happy to talk more about the other books that are being digitized. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to John. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Faulkner. I'm curator of prints, drawings, and photographs here at the library. And this first, oh, it's not mine. This first slide, if you can see it at all, uh, is just put up really to give you a sense of the breadth and depth of the collections of prints, drawings, and photographs from South Asia that we hold in the library. Um, my colleague, Marnie Roy, is going to be speaking more about prints and drawings. So in this very short few minutes, I'm going to restrict myself to photographs. Um, and just in... Um, by way of introduction, the British Library's collections of, of photographs from India are probably the largest and most important historical collection in a public institution. And they range from the East India Company's first sponsorship of photography for archaeological purposes in the mid-1850s through to the work of commercial studios, amateurs, and private collections from viceroys down to private soldiers. Um, and just one more slide which shows you some ways in which these collections have been used in publications and exhibitions. Some of this material is, is still available, uh, but it gives some sense of the breadth and use of these collections. Um, so a selection of a treasure, very difficult. But the item I'd like to introduce to you among many is what's known by us as the Lucknow album. It's an item of major importance and fascination recording both an early chapter in the history of photography in India and documenting many of the participants in perhaps the most traumatic historical event of the 19th century in India, the Great Uprising or Rebellion of 1857 to 58. And it's the work of an Indian resident at Lucknow called Ahmed Ali Khan, 
who was derogar of the Husseinabad Imambara at Lucknow. And he also served as photographer to the court of the last ruler, Wajid Ali Shah. And this portrait of the king, if you can see it, serves as a magnificent illustration of the way in which photography was beginning to supersede the painted portrait while still integrating existing manuscript painting traditions. So it's an astonishing amalgam of photography and, and painting. Um, but the albums themselves, which contain over 300 small photographs pasted into two albums, contain architectural views of the city, as well as a unique series of portraits of members of Wajid Ali Shah's court. And these range from senior dignitaries. I'm oh, sorry, press it on. Uh, members of his, his retinue, um, a portrait of one of his relatives who came to England to intercede on behalf of the Kingdom of Awad with Queen Victoria unsuccessfully. Um, and many of these portraits of the Lucknow court would certainly repay further study and scholarship. The identities of some are uncertain and the background um, certainly merits more work. Um, the British annexation of Awad in early 1856 signaled the end of a vibrant cultural tradition. But Ahmed Ali Khan, who appears to have been taught photography by a member of the European community, then diverted his attention to the influx of Europeans into the city, offering his services as a photographer uh, free of charge to Lucknow residents. Some of these portrait sessions, which took place at the Husseinabad in Ambara, um, are mentioned in the letters of the Reverend Henry Polehampton, who describes the photographer as a very gentlemanly man, a Mohammedan, and most liberal. He gives you freely as many as you want and takes no trouble, no end of trouble. And these are examples of some of the portraits he took of Europeans, this great fun the Europeans had in dressing up in local costume. And again, another member of Wajid Ali Shah's court and portrait photographs of European groups. So this collection adds up to an, a very comprehensive series of portraits of European residents, local Lucknow inhabitants, many of whom met their death in subsequent um, events in the uprising. Um, so their documentary importance is a record of the dying days of the kingdom was immediately recognized by contemporaries, and his photographs were very avidly collected. Um, in addition to their importance, they had an interesting afterlife in that Ahmed Ali Khan joined the rebels in Lucknow and fled in March 1858, and his album uh, and his photograph collections, his negatives and portraits were seized by the British. And these two albums that we have was subsequently given by Captain Trevor Wheeler to the Times correspondent, William Henry Russell. Um, then the volumes were separated, and, but by astonishingly good fortune, the companion to the album given to the India office in 1922 appeared on the market in the 1980s and has now been reunited with its companion in the library's collection. So this resonant collection is now complete and here and available for study. And as a very brief postscript, because I'm being signaled to end, um, Amin Ali Khan survived the events of the uprising and was later pardoned uh, a few years later. And subsequently, in 1862, he became the first Indian member to be elected to the Bengal Photographic Society since 1857. Um, so by a strange irony, the rebel was brought back into the fold of British India, at which point I will stop and I will hand you over to my colleague Marlene Roy who's going to tell you a bit more about our collections. As a visual arts curator at the British Library, I oversee a diverse range of materials from miniature paintings, British drawings on architecture and topographical views of South Asia, natural history drawings made in Calcutta in the early 19th century, drawings by Indian artists for British patrons, known as company drawings, as well as an important collection of popular and folk paintings of the, 18th, sorry, of the 19th and 20th centuries. 
collecting of these unique visual materials date back to 1801, when the East India Company established a library in London. The collections were later transferred to the India Office Library and ultimately to the British Library. In 2012-2013, I curated the exhibition Mughal India, Art, Culture and Empire alongside colleague Ursula Sims-Williams. Not since the 1980s had there been a major international exhibition devoted to the Mughal Empire. You may be wondering why the British Library would be a place to host such an ambitious exhibition. In fact, one of the major purchases for the East India Company was a collection of 69 albums and Mughal paintings and numerous manuscripts owned by the officer Richard Johnson. Johnson lived in Calcutta, Lucknow and Hyderabad during the late 18th century and actively acquired as well as commissioned paintings for his personal use. On returning to England, he was penniless and broke and sold his entire collection to the East India Company for a fraction of its value. Johnson's wonderful collection, which includes a well-known painting, Squirrels in a Plane Tree, by the eminent artist Abul Hassan, formed the core of the Mughal India exhibition. William Dalrymple reported in The Guardian, the result is one of the most magnificently mounted shows ever to be put on by the British Library. I'm sure he says that about all the exhibitions he visits. <laughs> Following the success of the exhibition, John Faulkner took a facsimile version of the exhibition to Kabul, where it was appropriately placed in the Queen's Palace near the Mughal Emperor Babur's tomb. And later it went on to New Delhi, where it was exhibited at the Indira Gandhi Center for the Arts. And on the screen, I've just selected a few highlights from the exhibition details um, and the displays. I'm sure many of you may have seen the exhibition, but in case not, you can visit it on our blogs. In the 1920s, the library acquired the Darashiko album, a rather splendid album of Mughal paintings, and it was featured in the Mughal exhibition. The album is known to have been compiled by Darashiko the eldest son and heir of Mo Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, from an inscription in the prince's hand on folio two, which dates to 1646 to 47. The inscription rec records the gift of the album to his beloved wife, Nadira Banu Begum, his cousin and daughter of Sultan Parviz, whom he had married in 1633. The album contains 68 folios arranged in facing pairs of paintings interspersed with specimens of calligraphy. A selection of the album is featured on the screen. On the far left, you can see Nadira Banu Begum. She's, um, there's a green background. And next to her is a companion painting showing Dara Shiko presenting her a jewel. As patron, Dara Shiko commissioned portraits of himself, his wife, as well as the influential women of his court, including his sister, Jahanara. The rest of the illustrations in the album reflect his personal interests, including subjects such as natural history, and portraits of fakirs and saints, signifying his knowledge on the mystical branches of both Islam and Hinduism. If you have a moment, you can see a selection from the Darashiko album on display in the Treasures Gallery. And I should mention the Treasures Gallery is free to the public, so feel free to wander in and out, and you can also see um, the Akbar Nama. The second treasure, and it was quite difficult to choose what kind of treasure to choose, so I chose something which I quite enjoy looking at. And it's an album illustrating the Mughal provinces. And it was prepared for a Frenchman named Colonel Jean-Baptiste Gentil in 1770. Gentil was a French mercenary who served the Nawab Shuja Udala of Oud. And he lived in Faisabad. Gentil was part of a network of British and European connoisseurs who were instrumental in the continuation of the regional artistic traditions by establishing in independent ateliers. The artists Nevesi Lal and Mohan Singh worked for Gentil. Mohan Singh would go on and continue working for Richard Johnson, who I mentioned previously. Alongside their contemporaries, they prepared this album of maps of the Mughal Empire, as well as a history of the Mughal Empire, which is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, as well as another album of paintings similar in style to our atlas in the Victoria and Albert Museum. The second slide I have of the Gentil Atlas, you can see some of the nice details which have blown up. And one on the far left, you can see Ravana being approached and Hanuman flying in from above. And some of the smaller details which I noticed alongside were a porcupine, a pangolin, and another battle, um, sorry. Um, there's some British soldiers attacking uh, a lion. 
And I should mention, it was through the influence of Jean Ti and his contemporaries, Antoine Pollier and Richard Johnson, that brought a shift in artistic approach. So previously, we've seen these very beautiful, rich details in mogul paintings, which use a very opaque watercolor or heavy pigment, which is burnished. But when you have Europeans coming into town and commissioning works, they were more done in a watercolor approach and much more quickly uh, produced paintings. And Jean Ti's volume contains 21 maps of the Mughal provinces, um, and each of them is illustrated with these fine details. And if you want to learn more about the prints and drawings collection, you should come to the next talk by Jerry Losty, which will be on the art of Sita Ram. And I will now turn to Antonio Moon, who will talk about the India Office records. Hello. Well, my treasure is perhaps ambitiously a whole collection, the India Office records. And these are the records of the British administration in London of pre-independence India. There's 14 kilometers of them. And they're all held here at the library. They're public records, so everyone has a right to consult them. And they're an unparalleled collection of colonial records and therefore a great source for anyone who's interested in the history of South Asia. Now, that to the left is the headquarters of the East India Company in Leadenhall Street. The company, as you know, evolved from being a trading operation to an administrator of empire. The picture on the right is that of the India office, which supplanted the East India Company. And um, it's just off Whitehall now, part of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. The records come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, East India Company was famously described as an empire in writing because everything had to be committed to paper. We have, for example, a complete run of the East India Company minute books from 1599 to 1858, recording every decision made by the company's directors at their weekly meetings. We've got logbooks, about 10,000 logbooks of the voyages taken by the company ships. Um, There's a particularly nice one taken from the log of the Rochester, which sailed from China to, um, from Britain to China in 1710. They've put the whole sort of fleet formation in the front of the, front of the document. We've got maps, not only political and military maps, which you would expect, but information about the lands and the peoples of South Asia presented in visual form and anything you can really imagine about the character of the land, whether it's um, the agriculture, the industries, the railway networks, you'll probably find that we've got a map for it somewhere in our records. Um, one thing, one map I particularly like is this map of languages spoken in Hyderabad in 1941. It's extracted from the Hyderabad census of that year. At this time, the census compilers were being encouraged to present their mass of statistical information in new, attractive visual ways. I think that's a nice one. We have many official reports that you can't really see it, but it's um, from the Sedition Committee looking at so-called revolutionary movements in 1918. They documented all the murders and robberies in Calcutta over a period of years. It's fascinating just to turn the pages of that one. And we have iconic documents. This is the instrument of abdication of Edward VIII. The Indicoff office holds a copy because Edward VIII was, of course, um, Emperor of India as part of his many roles, and this was kept very carefully as one of the what they call the parchment records. I thought I'd just give you two themes to give you an idea of the range of the holdings. First theme, World War I. As you know, the Indian contribution to World War I was enormous, 1.4 million men serving overseas, a completely volunteer army, many fighting on the Western Front. We hold in the India office an unusual collection of letters home from Indian soldiers on the Western Front. They're written in the soldiers' native languages, and then they were translated by the censor of Indian males and his team, and then these translations were typed up for the use of the India office in London. That's an example there. And although these letters have obviously very, very heavily mediated, nevertheless, they're a rare survival of the thoughts of Indian soldiers faced with this unique situation in which they found themselves in. This I took from an anonymous Punjabi Hindu. It says, um, it's describing the village in France. It says, 
The French people say that where it was so rare to see anyone hopping on a wooden leg, the sight has become only too common now. These records we have actually digitized, and they're all available on the Europeana website, Europeana 1914 to 18, and there's also a lot more about the Indian soldiers on our British Library learning pages. The second theme I've chosen is the theme of health and disease. Empire obviously was only possible if the British settlers didn't get sick and die, and of course many of them did, and many of the records show a wish to preserve and improve the health initially of soldiers. This is um, a design for a stretcher, 1844, submitted to the East India Company by a self-styled inventor for conveyance of the sick in battle. I'm not sure it was ever implemented, but the designs are beautiful. And we have material on diseases, smallpox, cholera, plague, leprosy, we, on hospitals, on drugs and cures, on public health and sanitation. And our health records range from high-level policy documents to fine detail of individual cases. This, for example, is the temperature chart of one Mohammed, 25, who was cured of malaria in 1897. So we're really going down to the hourly temperatures of an individual patient. You can find many of these in our records. Botany as well played a part. We've got guides to plants and medicinal va value. This is um, extract of Burberry plant, and Burberry was much used in Indian medicine, particularly for eye conditions. We've got materials about medical education um, for specialists in the masses. This I rather like. This is um, for the is in an army pamphlet, um, The Prevention of Malaria and Warfare, and it shows the infection cycle of malaria in a very easy to understand way. Of course, the malaria transmission, how it was transmitted, was discovered in Calcutta by Ronald Ross in 1897. So I'll just conclude by saying that we're digitizing this health material. It's all going to be online next year. But I've only picked two themes. There are many others. Um, our email is ior at bl.uk, so do address any questions. And now I've also brought some brochures in case anyone's interested. So now I'll hand over to my colleague, Noor Sobas Khan. You just press that, that one. There you are. Okay, brilliant. I think. Maybe. So, I have the dubious honor of presenting last. These were quite tough acts to follow, and they presented some of the most beautiful treasures that we hold here. Um, just to give a brief introduction um, to the collections that I oversee. So my name is Noor Sobras Khan. I'm the lead curator for South Asia. I work together with a large team of curators who oversee the South Asia collections that are in South Asian languages. So we hold, I think Jamie mentioned, about half a million printed books in South Asian languages and 20,000 manuscripts. And here you have a breakdown of what those languages are. So we have North Indian languages, Assamese, Bengali, Gujarati. I won't go through all of the South Indian languages, as well as Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit, Tibetan. And then what I oversee are Urdu and the South Asian languages in Perso-Arabic script. So this gives you a sense of the complexity and richness of our collections in South Asian languages. It probably won't come as a surprise to this audience that we hold such a large amount of material in South Asian languages, but it often does come as a surprise to audiences, so I thought it's always worth highlighting the amount of material we hold in the languages of South Asia. So it was quite difficult to actually decide which manuscript or which treasure to present to you today. I've chosen one um, of our manuscripts that's been recently digitized, and I hope that you'll be able to see some of the detail. Okay. I've chosen the Pemnim, which is a Dakni Urdu manuscript. It's one of our oldest Urdu manuscripts. Um, it dates to the late 16th century. Um, it's one of the finest examples of manuscript illustration from the court of Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah II, who ruled the kingdom of Bijapur from 1580 to 1627. Um, it contains 34 miniature paintings, some of which I'll show you today, illustrating the love story. It's a Sufi spiritual love story between Prince Shahji and the Princess Mahji. And I'm hoping to take you through the story very briefly through the illustrations in the manuscript, um, although it's also been put online. So if you can't see the details here, you can always look at it on our website later. So the author, the author's name is Hassan Manju Khalji. 
He claims in his introduction that the manuscript was written in the year 999 Hijri, so in the Islamic calendar. However, if you read through the introduction of the manuscript, the author demonstrates a sort of fixation with the number nine in keeping with the court of Bijapur, where the Sultan had a fixation with the noras, or the nine rasas, or essences of art. So in his introduction, the author says, well, it was written in the year 999, but it also has 199 rhyming couplets, 999 quatrains, and then he praises the 99 names of God. So scholars have quite reasonably doubted whether the dating of the manuscript to the year 999 is accurate or not. Um, but art historians have had a look at the stylistic elements as well as the text and have said that roughly it does fall around that time, which is the end of the 16th century. So it was originally... Uh, I'll show you some of the illustrations here. Um, in Blumhardt's catalog, and those of you who use our collections will be familiar with Blumhardt, who is this sort of polymath who cataloged a, a number of our South Asian uh, collections. He misidentified the manuscript as a variation on the Padmavat of Jayasi, which is also a Sufi love story of, of spiritual realization um, and, and eventual union. And although the, the manuscript shares the central feature of narrating a spiritual quest through the trope of a love story, um, it is actually a, a completely separate work, and it's not actually based on, on Jaisi's uh, Padmavat. So in many ways, this manuscript has not been quite as well studied, even though it is very unique. We actually haven't found another version of this text. We don't have anything else by this author. And the language of the text, the Dakni Urdu, is quite unique as well. It's been studied by the scholar David Matthews. Many of you will be familiar with him. And he identified that it contains a lot of Marathi and Telugu. And so it really would require a team of scholars to come together to look at the text itself. So it's online now. So should there be a team of you here in the audience, please come together and study it. Um, just a suggestion. So. Um, not unlike other tales of in the Persianate tradition of spiritual awakening and the search for truth through love, the story begins with the hero, Shahji, encountering an image of his as yet unseen beloved, the princess Mahji, which is carried to him by a tortoise. Now, this is not portrayed in the manuscript, which is a real shame, I think. And she also receives a delivery from a tortoise of the portrait. And again, I wonder if this might be down to a misinterpretation of the language. But still, it's a charming anecdote. So the two protagonists receive images of each other and immediately fall in love without actually having seen each other in person. Um, the main hero, and I'll just briefly take you through the story here, Shahji, he then goes on a quest in search of the princess, Mahji. And one charming detail that I'm not sure if you can see, but please have a look at this online, is that throughout the illustrations, the hero carries an image of the beloved on his heart. Her actual portrait is painted on his chest throughout the, every time he's portrayed in the manuscript. So you have the use of these sort of very charming visual metaphors that you, I haven't actually encountered in any, other, um, in any other illustrations of this kind of story. So this is the scene pictured here, I was hoping we'd have a bigger screen, but again, you can have a look at these online, where the hero, he journeys to an island that quite conveniently, um, the king of the island is his paternal uncle. And so he travels there, he encounters the princess for the first time, and he promptly faints dead away. And so we have, a, uh, this is a recurring theme throughout the manuscript, he faints dead away, that's the first picture of him. Um, another recurring visual trope in the manuscript is after he's sort of recovered and, and, and sort of is coming to terms with the fact that he's located his, his beloved. He's then engulfed in flames of passion, which I don't know if you can see in this middle picture, but it's, it's a metaphor, but they've depicted it quite literally with him being on fire and being fanned by his courtiers to cool his passions. And then, of course, no love story is complete without there being complexities and obstacles in the way. So at one point, and this is, I suppose, where the spiritual metaphor comes in, he thinks at one point that actually the real princess who's in front of him is merely a reflection of the image that he carries of her in his heart. And so he falls out of love with the real princess and believing that the image that he has of her, this idealized vision, is the real princess, the real object of his love. He then, first he bursts into tears, which you see in this, in this image here of a stream of tears. And then he goes on a search for the truth that involves meditation in isolation. And he abandons his beloved, um, who then passes. And this is a very interesting aspect of this manuscript as well. So up to this point, it's been a fairly straightforward 
Persian Sufi love story. At this point, it integrates the Indian Baramasa, or the, the months of the year, that the genre of describing the way that the seasons pass and the emotions that are associated with each season. This genre then gets integrated into the text. And so we have the Princess Mahji, who's been abandoned by her beloved, passing time with her companions in a number of charming illustrations, the first, in the first of which she's playing with pet birds and they're playing board games to pass the time. She's always depicted a bit isolated from her companions off to the side. Um, she also is inflamed by passion and longing in the second picture and is being doused with water by her attendants. So um, it, the, the visual metaphor is, is continued throughout the manuscript. And then at the end here, we have them setting off fireworks, perhaps for Diwali. And again, she's slightly isolated and melancholy, waiting for the return of the hero. He, in the meantime, is off journeying. He just needed a bit of time, you know. And, um, and eventually he um, returns and when he realizes that the actual physical princess is his beloved and it's not merely the image that he carried of her that he was in love with, he faints again. <laughs> and upon awakening, the, the couple are finally united in matrimony and of the 34 illustrations, um, the vast majority of them deal with the joy of the, the union of the two lovers. And those of you, I'm sure this audience is very familiar with the genre of the Masnavi and the Sufi love story of the trials that are overcome and the eventual union of the two lovers, which is symbolic of the union of the soul with God. And in this case of, of overcoming one's own illusions of what truth consists in, because he's mistaken this image for the beloved, when actually the beloved was right in front of him the entire time. So you have here the last, this is just a small selection of the images. Um, again, when he faints, and then you have Mahji happily putting on her wedding jewelry. And then there's a whole other series of paintings which you can look at online in which they are celebrating the wedding with the procession. And then a final scene where they're together. This is the last image in the manuscript where she's offering him pan after they've been united. So that is the story of the pem nem, which I forgot, what I neglected to tell you, is, is the rule of love, is what it's called. So I would invite you to have a look at it online. We've digitized this manuscript. It's been on loan um, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to a number of, uh, and, and we're hoping that, um, that by digitizing it, it will generate scholarship on both the language and the images. Art historians have identified a number of, of sort of mysteries surrounding the text. It seems to have been disbound and rebound at some time, and the images are slightly out of order. The actual language and the poem itself requires further study, so I would invite all of you to have a look at it, one of our, one of our many treasures. And thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you everybody. We, we were doused by water, but that was passionately described, uh, beautifully illustrated, and um, impeccably choreographed as well, because we have a good 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So um, you may have questions about, more questions about those objects. You may want to know more about the context of the wider British Library collections and operations, uh, and or you may, I suspect, also have worked with our collections yourselves. And we'd love to hear from you if you have worked with our collections to create new uh, outcomes, new knowledge, new creativity. So um, over to you, and I will pass the microphone to Ursula, and you can pass it along, um, depending on who is most appropriate for the question. So, uh, we starting with the question right there. Oh. Uh, could, could, could you just say what you have in the way of Sanskrit, please? So, I'm not actually the curator of Sanskrit. We have um, a, a team member who, who supervises the Sanskrit collections. But we have, actually, it's on the slide. I don't know if we can go back to it, the exact numbers. But we have quite a large collection about... I think it's 16,000 manuscripts and another 3,000 um, fragments in Sanskrit, as well as a large collection of printed books. So we do hold quite large collections in Sanskrit. And, um, and please feel free to get in touch with us if you have questions about researching the collection. So, oops, sorry. Thank you. Any, oh, at the, at the front here, on the right. Hello. Um, as we've seen, the collections relating to South Asia in the British Library are hugely um, impressive and vast. 
Um, but I wanted to ask about some of the political sensitivities around that and the fact that so much material is here and not in South Asia. Clearly that fact is in some, um, in many instances, in fact, related to a history of, of, of colonialism and the like. And I wondered uh, your thoughts on that um, potential sensitivity and also the way in which the British Library as an institution responds to those questions. We heard right at the start, for example, about the, um, the fact that the Zoroastrian exhibition in Delhi involved, I think you said for the first time, material from the British Library being loaned back to, uh, to India. And some other examples of responses on the library's part would be quite, uh, quite interesting to hear about. So, great question. Uh, who wants to start on that as you all shuffle the microphone? <laughs> Yeah, well, Ursula, why don't you start on that particular point uh, on Zoroastrian, and then we can uh, build on it. Does this, do, how does this work? Just, just speak into it. It should be working. Okay. Um, well, I'm only going to, you mentioned, since you mentioned the Zoroastrian exhibition, um, the, the question of the origin of the collections was never under discussion at all. Um, it just wasn't an issue. And... Um, Like this, okay. Um, the, is that better? A little horizontal. Like this. <laughs> like that. <laughs> ah, got it. Sorry. Um, the question of um, the origin of the manuscripts was never under discussion at all. Everybody was really pleased that we brought these to India, um, and it, it's been really good that we've been. Politics hasn't entered into it at all. We've been able to work collaboratively, put the past behind, move forward, do what we can to make all the knowledge and the treasures that we have available to everybody. But I'm only speaking for that, so... Uh. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, and then other colleagues might want to come in, I think, um, as you say, it's, it's a historical reality that we are working with. Uh, and for us, we talked. I talked earlier about our international purpose, which is all about working in partnership for mutual understanding and knowledge. Uh, and everything that we've talked about uh, just now and all the uh, projects that we embark on with these collections are uh, uniformly and uh, always uh, carried out in partnership with partners from India or South Asia. Uh, we think we have particular expertise on the digital front. We are, uh, I think it's fair to say, world leading in that front. Uh, and we've put in uh, an enormous amount of effort and funding uh, and uh, energy, uh, I think, to digitizing as much of these collections as we can. Uh, wherever the physical collections are, they will always be inaccessible to someone uh, by definition of only being in one place at uh, one particular point. Uh, and so I think uh, for us as a library as a whole, uh, and certainly in relation to these collections, digitization is um, at the heart of what we're doing and at the heart of the way that we're, we're working with that question. Um, and any, any other more specific comments that anyone wants to add? I mean, I'm mindful of time as well. Uh, Antonia. I'll just say briefly that we've embarked on very large-scale digitization projects and as part of the commercial partnerships that we've done, part of the conditions of that partnership are that there's free access to key institutions in South Asia as well. So in other words, they're getting the benefit of this sort of thing. And it's something we are conscious of and have been conscious of really right from the outset, the need. I mean, we were one of, before digitization, when microfilm was a thing, we were exchanging microfilms with institutions in South Asia for the very reason that you're, you're suggesting. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, in the middle there, uh, just wait for the microphone to come to you. It's on its way. So is it, I mean, I'm just going to build upon the question he asked. Uh, once the digitization completes, is there a possibility that then these works go back to where they rightfully belong? Because then the purpose is kind of served. Everyone has access to the work because it's at the British Library in a digital format. And then the rightful owners can have the work. So I, in terms of those numbers, whatever we said, 500,000 printed books and uh, tens and tens and thousands of manuscripts, uh, we're at the beginning of a really complex and super expensive and uh, uh, lengthy process. So uh, we're probably focusing more on how on earth we get all these things digitized. Um, people talk about digitization as if it's um, in smaller collections, it's, it's an easier uh, uh, endeavor. With, with collections as vast as ours, it takes an awful long time. So I think 
in terms of the conversations we're having with our partners at the moment, it's much more about how can we collectively get this material digitized. Uh, and it will take, uh, do we know how long it will take? It will take, uh, it's, I mean, it's fourth road bridge painting uh, territory here. Um, so that, I mean, honestly, that is where the discussions are with our partners. And that's what, um, certainly not only seeing it from our perspective, but from our partner's perspective, that's where the, the impetus is to, to get them digitized in the first place. And, uh, oh, in a second, but there's someone, a uh, lady at the back. This digitization of all the material which you have, is it only for the institutions or for common people just to Google it and find it and read it? Uh, so others can talk in more detail, but absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's as open as we can be, and in most cases, completely open, uh, as is the case with, uh, with most of our digitization projects. Um, I mean, does anyone want to talk about the mechanics of the digitization in more detail? As I've got this, I might say that um, the Qatar digitization project, for example, is a very large digitization of Middle Eastern materials from the India Office Records, which is available online. It's a sort of model of its kind, the sort of interface it has. And we do try as far as possible to link with philanthropic or um, institutions like, say, the Welcome is funding the medical records. And this is on condition that everything obviously is free and available to all sort of 24 hours, 24-7. The commercial thing is slightly different because obviously if they're offering a large scale um, project that we might not be able to get done by other means, it's a sort of balance. But um, at the end of seven years, we are then entitled to use the materials as we wish. So it seems to be a good trade-off. So we have a, a sort of mixed model, if you like, of commercial, philanthropic and um, sort of research funding. Yeah. But with the end game of everything being available for everyone uh, at the ultimate point. Yeah, I just wanted to use the example of Two Centuries of Indian Print, which is the project that Leili and I work on, um, which is, uh, again, a mass digitization project for our South Asian printed collections. Um, that's going to all be made freely available online at the close of the project. One thing we should mention that might not be clear is that we actually have to fundraise in order to put together these projects. So often the, and, and you know, I mean, our own resource, I mean, the collections are so large that our, our resources as an institution, I mean, are, are not sufficient. So we go externally, we put together projects, we make grant applications. There's a huge effort in the different sections to actually create projects that will put images online to make them accessible and, and we feel that we have a, a real um, obligation as a cultural heritage institution to do that so so yeah so certainly our project as well um, will will be you can google things and, and anyone can access them anywhere in the world so that's the the objective there Susanna was waving her dreaded red folder and I don't know if that means we've got one more or that we means we've got one more uh, gentleman at the front Um, as, as, a, as an old Luddite and perhaps a, a romantic, um, I, I find it really difficult to appreciate uh, such wonderful uh, collections um, on, on, on a screen. Uh, in fact, I, I feel positively put off by them, particularly the blue light in the middle of the night. Um, what I would really like to see is, is actually a sort of face-to-face -face conversation with these wonderful objects. And I would urge, if you haven't got a uh, program already, that you have some kind of chronological uh, uh, cycle of, of displaying, you know, top ten from from each decade almost, uh, or, or at, at least uh, each century. Um, having travelled in in uh, in uh, Iran and in in uh, China, you know, they, they are really devoid of the goodies that you got here. Uh, and some of us who live in this country uh, can still appreciate that. And it would be fantastic to have a chronological approach to it rather than this rather bitty approach that I often see. There's a lot there which we probably can't go into in huge detail beyond to uh, accept what you say uh, and, and reflect on it. Um, we do have uh, 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 an ambitious and growing exhibitions program that takes different approaches uh, and includes exhibitions here and indeed uh, across the world and across the country. I think there's an important thing here about the UK as well, and not everything being in London, uh, which, which leads me to say we, we've got a big exhibition opening at the Library of Birmingham that we've, we've fundraised for with support from the Heritage Lottery Fund, looking at South Asian presence in Britain. It's going to be a fantastic exhibition opening in July at the uh, newly opened Library of Birmingham. Uh, we will take different approaches to different exhibitions, um, depending on audience, uh, uh, context, and so on, but, but what you say is, is, is useful. Um, I think Marlene is very quickly going to add to that. Just one quick thing is that anyone who holds a reader's pass can come into the British Library, order up any material they wish to view, anything that was 
some of the items on display, unless they're restricted for conservation reasons, you can come in, order it up, and view it within 70 minutes. So anyone holding a reader's pass can come in. You can, the print room, which holds the prints, drawings, and photographs collection is open by appointment, but the main reading room is open Monday through Saturday, so feel free to come in and register as a reader. And that's a really important point to end on, actually, that unlike some museums and galleries, absolutely anything of those 150 million items is yours in the reading room. Uh, well, not yours, but uh, yours to examine. Uh, in, rewind that bit. Um, and to make the point that reader passes are not only for uh, exclusively for academics or for writers, they are for everyone. Um, and you should feel... Uh, uh, you should feel that you have the opportunity to come in and look at this material. So, um, uh, Susanna is definitely telling me to wind up now, so I will just thank all of my six colleagues uh, for a wonderfully rich session. Thank you for the questions, uh, and uh, look forward to William and his next panel. <laughs>